Hello, my name is Sean Sopardi, and today I'll be talking about the interpretation and monitoring of time normative systems. This work was done in collaboration with Gordon Patch from Malta, Fernando Shepachnik from Buenos Aires, and Gerardo Schneider, also from the University of Gothenburg. This work relates to normative systems, that is, laws or contracts, that talk about what should be done rather than what is done. So these include obligations, prohibitions, and permissions or rights. And formally speaking, we represent these using the ontological logic, which is also called the logic of norms. This is uh, different from LT L the LTL we are used to, <clears throat> where uh, in LTL, if we are to represent these systems in LTL, we would lose some information. For example, we wouldn't be able to talk about different levels of violation. Now, um, uh, in literature, what is missing uh, is an appropriate appropriate discussion and review of uh, different possibilities when we are talking about real time and different interpretations to the um, uh, to these norms, and also monitorability of these systems when they are monitorable and when uh, when not. Here we are uh, going to talk about uh, these kinds of uh, time modalities for these norms. And we're going to consider the, their monitorability and uh, how to actually perform, how to implement an algorithm for, as in, uh, for monitoring, yes. Let's start. So we'll start with uh, seeing a bit, not too formal, not formal at all, uh, the, what the deontic logic is. Then we'll take a look at um, uh, what happens when we add time and then we'll consider monitoring. So the antic norms usually are represented in the following manner. We have uh, an obligation, a forbidden or prohibition, and a permission. We are a part P may be obligated to do an action A, and that is satisfied if part P actually does A. He is forbidden from doing A if A is not is it is satisfied if A is not performed, or um, they are permitted. To do A is only satisfied if the other parties allow party P to actually perform A. Now, uh, when we are talking about contracts and laws, we also want to talk about what happens if there is a violation. We want to talk, so for example, if I, uh, we know that I'm obligated to, to park within the lines, but if I don't park within the lines, to come back into compliance with the law, I need to pay a fine. So we are presented in this manner, where we have uh, a contract is repaired by another contract. Here, a contract is a structure over these, uh, these norms, for example, with sequence, conjunction, and the usual operators. This called reparation and its semantics is that when at any point in C it, it is violated, then the parties must start satisfying C prime to be in compliance with this, with this spec. There are different aspects here, interesting aspects. Uh, these uh, specifications are multi-party, they relate to the interaction between different parties, and they can be either state or action-based, which can have uh, different implications uh, rep rep um, uh, representation-wise. And uh, it's good to recall here that these are meant to reflect legal and philosophical normative systems rather than the usual uh, system behavior we talk about when we are using um, uh, usual temporal logics. So now um, let's start to discuss what happens when we add time to the ontic logic. So uh, we identify three ways that time can be added, either by using relative intervals, where uh, if this obligation starts to hold, then A must be performed after the next five steps, but before 10 time steps. Can I, it can also be represented by having something like a start of the norm modality and end of the norm modality, so that this A must be performed sometime before this starts holding, or by adding clocks and then referencing these clocks as some kind of um, uh, guard for, for obligations, for example. But uh, yeah, adding more clocks, add more complexity, well, these can, uh, can avoid that complexity. 
So here we'll be focusing on using these, uh, these relative intervals for uh, when discussing uh, time for simplicity. So let's talk first with a first interesting aspect is duration. That implies certain choices that we can make certain choices when uh, deciding on an interpretation for this uh, for this syntactical object. This could mean do a once between this interval, which is okay in uh, for example an action based uh, logic. It could mean sustain a during the interval, make sure the state a is always true in that interval, or it could mean start doing A during the interval or ensuring A, and then perhaps finish doing it in that interval or not. Here, all of these can be useful in, uh, to represent something useful in normative systems. And essentially, they can all be, be represented also in an action-based semantics. For example, the latter by having a start and end event for corresponding to each action, the second um, can be represented uh, immediately to uh, appropriate semantics, and the same for one. Another interesting aspect is when there is a violation, and this duration. Um, uh, possibly we can um, rank violations depending on how long the violation persisted. For example, if I'm trespassing for two hours, and it's that's worse than trespassing for one hour. And then perhaps we can give that the duration as a parameter to the reparation clause and give fines proportionally. So I think this notion of time is uh, giving us more specificity too, in terms of, uh, of talking about violation. Another interesting uh, aspect is what happens when there is an overlap between different norms or there is a temporal superposition. So for example, uh, let's look at, the, at this. So this symbol is, let's say it's a conjunctive symbol. We're going to use this as, instead of uh, the normal disjunction to avoid any implication about idempotency, and we'll see now why. Imagine we have this contract. So we have an obligation to do A between zero and 10, and another obligation to do A between five and 15. Perhaps they come from different contracts from different specifications, and we are trying to satisfy them together. Here we have a choice of interpretations. Either we interpret this symbol as a normal conjunction, where if A occurs at time step five, then both obligations are discharged. Or A may discharge only one of the obligations. And removing that and non idempotency potency. However, the problem here is to decide which one would be discharged. Perhaps one solution could be to simply choose the one that uh, started holding first, have some kind of state stack approach, or even have the uh, the the user when uh, when doing the action point out the norm they are trying to satisfy. In the attempt case, we actually have this, the same choice if you see this without, without these intervals. But the interpretation here, the possibility for this second interpretation, sorry, for the second interpretation here is more, more prominent since uh, this overlap can happen uh, in, uh, is not syntactically immediately obvious. Since imagine there is some structure before this and some structure before this. And to some, uh, in some cases, th there may be overlap, in some cases not, which may or may not be uh, statically uh, deducible. So maybe we need, uh, there may be a need for some dynamic analysis at this point, which we, will, we want to consider more in the, in the future. Another aspect of the ontic logic is that usually we want to identify if there is any conflict in this, this contract. So here above we had a consistent overlap, but sometimes we can have a, a conflict, a conflicting overlap. <clears throat> so for example, in the end-time case, if we have a, we are forbidden from doing A and obliged to do A at the same time, then this is in conflict and it is always violated. And we can syntactically 
analyze this and tell the contract drafter this doesn't work. This contract cannot be satisfied. Go back to the drawing board. But if you have something more complicated with structure and time, then it may not immediately be clear if there is a conflict, there may be a need for dynamic analysis. Here, for example, we if a a a for example, there is a point here which cannot be where this contract can be satisfied. That is at the fifth time step. But the contract still remains not unsatisfiable, although perhaps um, the. Well, something useful we could do, we could do here is to, to identify these points of no conflict and immediately exclude them from the text of the contract. That is, change this to four and this to four. And, and this to not four, but six. Another interesting aspect, lastly, is uh, the attempt to do an action, which we actually need to, to be able to to monitor for, to determine satisfaction of a permission. Since permission, if you recall, is uh, satisfied only if all the contracting, contracting parties allow the person who has the right to perform the action to perform. So we need to detect that the person tried to perform the action and we need to detect that it failed, that somehow the contracted parties did not synchronize on that action. This is essential for monitoring of this uh, permission, as uh, we shall see in the next action. In the time case, fa failure to uh, the failure can also not appear close to the action. If the action has some kind of duration, then uh, we can start the action and end either in its success or in its failure later on after some steps, which we need to take care of in, uh, in an appropriate formalism. Now we are going to talk about monitoring of, uh, of these, uh, of the anti-clogic in general and these timed cases. We have given a brief overview of, uh, of the considerations that have to be taken into account when constructing a, a, uh, a time beyond the logic. In the future, we'll, uh, we'll be working on trying to formalize in a general beyond the logic this, this, uh, these considerations. Here we'll be talking about uh, monitorability of the auto logic in, in the sense of satisfaction and violation monitorability, standard notion in uh, LTL, where uh, we want to talk about whether a, a, uh, a formula we can determine if it is ever satisfied. For example, in LTL, if we have something like eventually A, we can determine if it is satisfied, if A occurs, otherwise we cannot determine its violation or if it is violation monitorable, if we can detect that it has been violated. Now, um, obligation to do A is clearly fully monitorable. We need, just need to check whether A occurred or not. We're taking an action-based semantics here. If A occurred in this instance, then no. Then yes, it was satisfied, otherwise no. For, forbidden from doing A is fully monitorable. If A occurred, then violated. If they did not occur, then it is satisfied. For permission, as we just mentioned, we need to monitor for attempts. If A was tried, was attempted, and it occurred successfully, then uh, it's okay. But if it failed, then the permission was violated. If we allow more complex uh, stuff, for example, by allowing LTL inside the obligation, and there are there is where that exists, then something like this only becomes satisfaction monitor, but it takes on the monitorability of the LTL formula inside, basically. But allowing uh, allowing uh, something like this, this is, is only satisfaction monitor, but inside here it does not really make sense. Obligations usually need to be bounded by some time point. If we are talking about a contract, we, for example, a rental contract, you need to pay at some point. You can't continue postponing the obligation forever. So although this is still satisfaction monitorable, it is not useful. And something that is putting something here that is not monitorable would also not be useful in general in terms of normative systems. If we add timing, 
to these norms, we claim that um, uh, if we if it is within a finite interval, then of course there will be full monetarability since the the contract will be bounded. And we can since we can observe a finite interval in a finite amount of time, then we can determine satisfaction or violation. Something also having something like uh, like globally around a a contract makes the contract become only violation monitorable since of course um we, we need to observe the the continue observing the infinite trace to check for satisfaction of the contract usual operators uh, operator sequence conjunction negation disjunction maintain monitorability preparation also the feasibility is also uh, an interesting aspect that we have not discussed here. It relates to having priorities between uh, between different norms, but it also maintains monitorability. Also, something that occurs in the ontic logics, also in uh, some extensions of ATL with triggers, for example, expressions can be guarded by regular expressions, which maintains monitorability since we can monitor for regular expressions. Also, if we do this by past time LTL, then it's fine since it's in the past. Again, as we talked about before, allowing to look ahead to the future. And these guards would not be really something anyone would want to do from a normative system point of view, but it would mean that it's not monitorable, that the expression would probably not, become, um, not be monitorable if we allow an restricted LTL. But for certain subsets, it, it would work anyway. Another interesting thing that we did not uh, consider here is monitoring for blame assignments. Here we have focused on checking whether the contract was, was, was fulfilled or not. But in normative systems, we are also interesting to interested to check that if the contract was not fulfilled, who was to blame for it? This is also interesting in, in terms of uh, for reparation. So if you know that Party P violated the contract, you only want them to perform the operation, not the other, not the other um, parties also. As an algorithm for monitoring, um, in previous work, we have worked in the untimed case. There are multiple operational semantics for, uh, for powerful uh, dialectic logics that can be repurposed for monitoring. We have also worked on some uh, automata representation of dialectic logics that can be repurposed easily. Here we suggest two different layers. One that we use is this previous work by uh, by uh, by monitoring an untimed formula that corresponds in some way to the timed formula. For example, if we have something like this with 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 an interval, then we can move that interval instead to to the action, and then we have another layer that monitors for for these actions and feeds them appropriately to the to the untimed layer. This method is uh, was inspired is similar to that to that proposed by uh, O. Uh, Ocknein and Warren uh, in a paper in RV14 for um, uh, MTL for metric time logic. In conclusion, here we have uh, given uh, an introduction to different flavors and aspects of the entropy logics when considering time. We have discussed the monitorability. And concluded uh, that uh, that uh, the ontic logics always seem to have this at least uh, satisfaction or violation monitorability, and this makes sense since usually if you have a contract, if you have a law, you need to be able to uh, to detect and find a time whether that law was violated or satisfied. Right? Yeah. For future work, we are going. We are considering the formalization. Of, uh, of this work, where we, uh, we have a general time logic that incorporates all the different choices we considered, and the uh, duration, and, uh, and what happens in the case of temporal superposition. Um, an implementation of the monitor algorithm we, we, dis we uh, discussed shortly for this logic, and to investigate the assignment and its difficulty in, uh, in terms of monitoring and uh, detecting actually this famous uh, who is to blame. So that's it. Um, thank you. I'll be here for any questions.
questions. Thank you.